Today we discuss Seneca's On the Shortness of Life, and instead of having an old man berate you about how short life actually is, and as you'll all find out once you, once you reach the dreaded age that I have, um, instead, of doing, instead of doing that, I thought what we would do is go around the room and have you identify uh, a passage that stood out to you that you would like to uh, comment on or ask a question about. This is one of the essays that I start underlining and then the whole thing gets underlined. Or it's like you should, you should underline the parts that you don't want to emphasize because there's so much in there that seems uh, relevant and good and you would save ink that way. But um, I'm sure you noticed some of this outstanding rhetoric and so forth. And so I'd like to hear your thoughts about it, including thoughts about what does any of this have to do with Stoicism? And what, what, is, what is the virtue at stake in any of this? Or is, is this even an issue of, of uh, virtue? I see a lot of virtue and vice talk, but what is, once again, I'm, like in the case with mercy, seem to be dealing with some subject that doesn't look like a standard Stoic topic. Doesn't look like the name of a Stoic emotion. Doesn't look like the name of a Stoic virtue or vice. All we care about is emotions, virtue, and vice is stoic. So what is this doing here? Um, so could I, how, how, why don't we start randomly with you, Bronson, and we'll just go around the room this way. You give us a, you give us a passage and make a, com make a 30 second or a minute long comment. OK, um, so in uh, section 14 um, on page 155, I thought it was interesting that um, he highlighted uh, all of the various um, philosophical schools that we've been talking about. Um, and it seems to me that he almost said at least if you're thinking philosophically, you are um, living your life as you should be, despite the fact that life is short, you're not wasting it looking into the future, looking to the past, you're discussing philosophical arguments. And even if you're discussing the wrong schools, they, it seems that you're at least still doing something correct. Is, does that seem to be a good interpretation? Well, uh, well. Uh, of course, you, you pick my favorite passage, because it says you're only really living if not only you do philosophy, but specifically you do history of philosophy. So it turns out that only those people doing ancient philosophy are really living life correctly. Um, so I don't know if you're just pandering to, to, the, to the relevant audience here, but um, yes, this one has got lots of red ink on it for me. And, uh, it's a good observation to make that he's very inclusive here. Um, if we wish by the greatness of mind to pass beyond the narrow confines of human weakness, there is a great tract of time to wander through. We may hold argument with Socrates, feel doubt with Carneades, find tranquility with Epicurus, conquer human nature with the Stoics, exceed it with the Cynics. And then he goes on, uh, later in section 14, the ones you should regard as devoting time to the true duties of life are those who wish to have as their intimate friends every day. Zeno, that's a Stoic, that's the founder of the Stoic school. Uh, Pythagoras, Democritus, neither of those are Stoics, those are pre-Socratic uh, philosophers. And all other high priests of good learning, Aristotle and Theophrastus, two more non-Stoic philosophers. So this is a very ecumenical statement, very open, not a partisan uh, stoic thing. Um, and so we've seen that tendency in him before, almost a tendency towards what Michael Alvarez was, was calling eclectic philosophy on the basis of that book that he read. Um, and the point is that um, basically the only way to not feel like life is short is to dwell on things that have happened over long and great stretches of time and to dwell on those things that have to do um, with the mind and so on. Um, so that's, that's a very good one. I don't, I don't think I have anything else to say about that, but that's a good, that's a good one to mention. All right, next. So in uh, appreciate it. so uh, on section two of on the tranquility of the mind, pages one seventeen, uh, really one eighteen. Gotcha. Um, 
sort of goes to like this passage where he sort of uh, speaks against like the uh, the habits of like more uh, well-off Romans to go off and sort of like take tours through the rest of uh, Italy to kind of uh, escape from like their problems at the moment. And um, like when I was reading this, like I don't know, he kind of like jumped out to me. Like this this isn't particularly like, philosophically inclined. But was travel like a particularly common uh, pastime for uh, Romans or just like you know ancient people of the era to like participate in? And if so, like, did the Stoics have anything in particular against travel? I know that there have been like texts <coughs> speaking on uh, how exile away from one's homeland isn't necessarily like a bad thing. But like, is there ever any mention about how? Uh, you know, there's the sort of themes now of travel being good for you and expanding your horizon. Is this ever? Yes. Right? Well, I think I think I mean yes. There is the stuff about exile, and if even exile isn't bad, how would travel be bad? Yeah. <laughs> um, exile is forced travel. Uh, so uh, I, I think we can pretty much infer it's not a bad thing per se. But what he's saying here is that it's not the cure for anxiety that people think it is. So you think if I was just if I just went on vacation and I was just at that spot in Hawaii that they're showing on that TV commercial or something, then I would be feeling tranquil. And the problem is that wherever you go, you're still there. Uh, he says you can't you can't as it were travel away from your own soul. So if you have an anxious soul then what you do is end up sitting on the beach kind of anxious in Waikiki or whatever. Um, you have to, and, and so travel does not immediately um, relieve anxiety, even vacation. So we're all, I'm sure, thinking, oh, it's just a couple of weeks and then I will be tranquil, right? School will be out and it'll be summer break. That's nice to think now. Um, and what you'll find is you're e equally anxious then once it comes. Maybe it'll be because of social anxiety, maybe it'll be because of um, anxiety about how you look when you go to the beach, anxiety about um, the fact that you can't go to the beach and actually have to take summer classes, or even worse than that, you can't take summer classes that you need to take because you have to work. Um, and you have to drive to work, and all of that's very stressful, and so forth. So the uh, changing our location does not change the cause of a lack of tranquility. Okay. Ah, okay. Yes. Um, or are you slow to action? If you don't seize the day, it slips away. When you seize it, it will slip, still slip away. And so you must compete with time's quickness uh, and the speed which you use it. You must drink swiftly, as if from a fast-moving torrent that will not always flow. Um, essentially, for me, uh, this means that um, people perceive life um, as moving slowly uh, in the present, but how, as you like look back, you see it like moving that like rapidly. For example, like school for me. Uh, day yeah. by day, it goes like very slowly, but like looking at it, like, it seems very quick now. Yeah, it seems very quick now. So essentially, like trying to like understand that it does move rapidly, and just looking at it, uh, just like trying to perceive it slowly, does not like make you more efficient. So like trying to take things day by day, and doing things in the moment rather than having it pass by swiftly, as was quoted. Even taking it day by day, it's still flows by quickly. Is that what you're saying? Or that if you, uh, I mean, if yeah, you yeah. only take it day by day, then it won't but go by as quickly. Yeah, essentially what I'm trying to say is like trying to like live up in the moment so like you can uh, complete as much as you can rather than like thinking about um, what could have been or like Okay, so that's, that's a nice thought and we hear a lot about that mindfulness and everything. Um, the strange thing is here he seems to be saying even even trying to do that doesn't work. Um, that, that's what you quoted. Even though you've seized it, it will still run away. And so in speed of using it, you must match the, match the swift, swiftness of time and drink quickly, as though from a whirling torrent that is not always going to flow. Yeah, so, actually, like, so he's saying the opposite of, of, of what you're saying, right? I, I think like what, what I was trying to say is like trying to like adapt to that. 
Why like, try to like contradict uh, that? You're not adapting it. You're contradicting it. You're saying no. If we if we have a mindful live in the moment, then time will appear to slow down and go more slowly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's, that contradicts with the, the bit that you read. I mean, which is fine. You yeah. might think that. That might be true. But it's odd to say that and then quote a text that says the opposite of it. Um, but it's an interesting point, and I really like what you said about think about it, think about the flow of time over the school year. So when it started in the beginning, seemed like it was going very slow and the days were long and filled with lots of different activities and meeting new people. And now at the end of the year, it seems to be rushing by so quickly there's that you don't have time to do anything about it. You can also do that with the calendar year. At the beginning in January, everything seemed, uh, uh, seemed fine and there's lots of time and everything's before you. By the time it gets to December, everything you've been planning to do that hasn't happened and you're running late for your Christmas shopping and, and you haven't seen the relatives that you wanted to and everything, and you run out of time. And in fact, you take any arbitrary length of time and do that, and you will see that from the beginning of it, time appears psychologically to be moving more slowly and towards the end to be moving more quickly. And so, of course, that applies to life. Life in the beginning seemed like everything being before you, it's going very slow and there's lots you can do. In fact, you can do anything you set your mind to and so forth. And then you reach this elderly, decrepit state and it looks like it's moving so fast that it's rushing by and you can't do anything with it. You can't, um, it's, it's, it's going too quick to be able to act. Um, so one thing he says is that recognize that that structure, that it has that, uh, that you will always feel like that for any arbitrary length of time for the entirety of life. And face that, take that into account. It means you have to actually try to do more if you're going to be having the same amount of time, not less. Okay, so that's, that's, a, that's a tough one. That's, that's, that's a... Um, Difficult one, and the, the, the exact advice one should take from that is not clear. Because he then goes on to say, and, and whatever you do, don't become too busy. Like, do more, do lots of stuff, but if you're busy, you're dead. Life for busy men is very short, he says. Okay, so it's not, it's not clear how to make use of that, but as a psychological fact about time perception, that is absolutely true. Yeah? If death is just an indifference? Does it really matter if your life seems short? If you're, if you're busy, maybe you have a better chance of actually acquiring virtue, and then it would seem irrelevant that it's short. Well, that's the question about what this is. Is it, is it supposed to be a virtue if life seems long? Yes. Isn't, since life itself is an indifferent, which is another way of putting the point that death is an, is mm -hmm. an indifferent, then length of life can't possibly be a good. Uh, but yet, um, perception of life being short, he thinks, is bad and produces emotional anxiety. So what is it that causes the perception that life is short? And let's figure what out what, what is, what's doing that and then attack that problem. Okay, and, and so I won't just answer that question. I think I know what he says that is, but we can, let's, let's go on and get some more texts on, on board here. Okay, so uh, mine is passage 7 of On the Shortness of Life, or um, section 7, page 146, uh, where he talks about how nothing can be done properly, or no activity can be done properly uh, when someone is busy with many things. Um, and he highlights that not in liberal arts, especially. But yes. <laughs> it seems like that's what a liberal arts education is. It's like you cover a lot of things. Um, most of education is covering a lot of uh, subjects. Um, and so I just think it's interesting that if you were to apply that to like what we do today, not like specialized school, but kind of like more broad, that he seems you would have been critical of it. Um, and it says later in the passage that uh, most people spend uh, an entire lifetime learning how to live uh, and then an entire lifetime learning how to die. And it seems that, for the most part, up until now, like, no one really has given that, um, or especially like allocated uh, time just to that. 
like learning how to do those activities. Um, right. Okay, so first of all, yes, I love the point about one, liberal arts are not possible without leisure. And in fact, no activity is possible without having time to do it. And the people that are good at things are the people that had time and spent the time to become good at it, period. Nobody's born good at anything, but especially liberal arts. Um, <clears throat> that just is a matter of putting time into it. And it, it's really poignant what he says, right? Um, no activity can be properly undertaken by a man who's busy with many things, not eloquence and not the liberal arts, since the mind, stretched in different directions, takes nothing, takes in nothing at depth, but spits out everything that has been, so to speak, crammed into it. Perfect, perfect motto for finals. <laughs> right? cram all this information in, spit it out on a final exam, and then it's just gone. It's just worthless. It hasn't, um, one, one hasn't learned anything by approaching it that way. Uh, that's why we don't have a final exam in here. Why, why everything's built onto long-ranging research you've been doing over 10 weeks. You need time in order to do uh, liberal arts. Um, now, and much darker is the second thing, second line you called attention to, and you didn't, you didn't quote exactly what he says. Yes, one must spend an entire lifetime in learning how to live, and, which may surprise you more, you have to spend an entire lifetime in learning how to die. So you're quite right that people don't actually spend a lifetime learning how to live. Most people don't give any, don't spend any time thinking about how to live. They're just too busy trying to survive, uh, basically. So if they're not even figuring out how they're going to live, then what they really aren't doing is figuring out how to die, which is why everybody has all these problems with death, thinks it's a bad thing, thinks it's the worst thing, cries at funerals. You know, In Seneca's mind, we should be having parties at funerals. That's, 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 that's great. So that suffering's over. That person doesn't have to deal with the anxiety and misery of this crazy, stupid world anymore. Um, and, we should, and we admire those people who know how to die and do it, do it the right way. Uh, you know, don't go kicking and, and, and screaming from it, but also, there are some people that even turn dying into this kind of art form where they actually make something uh, of their death like Socrates did. But it's a dark, it's a dark, dark saying, I think. Um, but another good one. So let's 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 move on to another one though. Uh, so the part I'm interested in is section fifteen, uh, and it says that what philosophy has made separate cannot self harm. No age will destroy those works. No age diminish them, um, and. I just like to feel like it is kind of contradictory to the fact that many like philosophy work I have has lost like even the Seneca's book. I'm so I'm so glad you said that. I, I, I actually wrote false with three exclamation <laughs> marks in my book for that reason, very reason. That is true. Time can lay waste to philosophy and has to ninety-nine percent of ancient philosophy. The works that were written by Greeks have not survived. And as you point out, even Seneca's. Okay, now we could interpret it to mean, oh, well, the great points of philosophy. You know, Hegel has this crazy doctrine that says any philosophy that disappeared, it had to, because it was it must have been worthless. All the good <laughs> stuff actually makes it and it actually keeps getting better and better until it leads to. Yeah. <laughs> um, but And so that's false. That's wrong. The loss of the works of Democritus is a lamentable thing. Loss of most of the, uh, Confucius' works. Loss of all of this early Buddhist stuff. Um, time does do great damage. So thanks for, you guys are, you guys are choosing some of, the, some of the best ones here. So what about you, Boone? Uh, Coincidentally, I picked the next section after here, which is section 16 on the shortness of life. And I like the quote of, but those who forget the past, ignore the present, and fear for the future have a life that's very brief and filled with anxiety. 
when they come to face death, the wretches understand too late that for such a long time they have busy themselves in doing nothing. And I think that that's it, you know, kind of going off what people have said earlier and what he said about the shortness of life is that many people are uh, just trying to survive and they may not look, they may not uh, think about the past or the, or the present or even what's going to happen, to, but they're just uh, trying to survive and then they come so unexpectedly to death because they've taken no time to think back. Right, and this relates to his claim that life divides into three parts. Mm -hmm. The part you've already lived, the part right now, now, and the part in the future. The part you're living right now is so short and vanishing that some people think it doesn't even exist at all, and it's constantly going into the past. The bit that's in the past cannot be changed and is already immune to fortune and so forth. And the part that's future we don't is totally not in our control and we shouldn't have any expectation about. And yet, it's possible to basically ignore all these parts, forget the past, ignore what's happening in the present, and then just dwell on the future with anxiety and fear, and those people never actually live, according to his <coughs> concept of life. It reminds me of a, a quote my dad always says about, our, like our dogs, uh, a great, great, a cowardly dog dies many times, a brave dog, but once. So That, that almost <laughs> sounds like a Senecan. Uh, sort of, your, your, your father should, you know, start writing these thoughts down at some point. This is, this is very, very philosophical. Because he does say that. Vicious people live short lives, and virtuous people are like immortal and never die, basically. Um, and in fact, that's the answer to the question of what is it that makes life seem short. It's vice. It's the fact that when we look back on what we've done in the past, we're not proud of it, but we think it's not been very good, and we look at the present and we realize we're not very good right now, and so we look at the future and we're afraid that we're not going to get any uh, better. But if it would be possible to look back on your life and think, think, no, I've done these things, this has been excellent, I've had these accomplishments, and I've helped these people, and you can reflect on virtues, then you would be comfortable with who you are in the present, and you would feel fine either about not having a future if you were going to die, or about whatever might happen to you. And so it's actually, that's how it relates to Stoicism, is that virtue and vice, in his view, is what makes life seem fast or short. Okay, Sarah, you're next. Um, my favorite passage is in the beginning, section one of, on the shortness of life. At the end of the section, the so it stands, we do not receive a life that is short, but rather we make it so. We are not beggars in it, but spend it. Just as great and pricely wealth, when it falls into the hands of a bad owner, is squandered in a moment, while a wealth that is by no means great, if it becomes the property of a good guardian, grown by, grows by use. So our span of life has ample measure for one who manages it properly. I thought it was a beautiful transition from the tranquility of one, which is the preceding chapter. Mm -hmm. And it really embodies the stoic mindset of being flexible and accepting what is and being able to make out of it um, what uh, is virtuous or, or what people, or what lets people be wise. And so um, it can be, it can be taken as a very positive thing, or uh -huh. a now positive we, thing, or a very uh, intentional way of living, um, I think. Because it's, it's up to us whether life is short or not. That right. is whether it seems... Right. Okay, now what does it mean? He says, we do not receive a life that is short, but rather we make it so. We're not beggars in it, mm -hmm. but spendthrifts. What does spendthrift mean? Um, I think it, it's... What I, the sense that I get of it is that it's uh, parallel to the moderation aspect of wealth that was introduced in the previous chapter, where um, you don't want too much wealth uh, because losing money is really a problem. 
um, if you have money, then you're going to lose it, and that's, that creates problems for you. Versus also um, that if you're nearing poverty, then that is also very difficult. So you don't want to be on either side of in the same sense. No, okay, that, that's nice to relate it related to life. his views on wealth because he's comparing time and money. But what does it mean to say we're not beggars so to, in it but spendthrifts? To spend life means to that you are able to choose who you put in it, what you do with it, and uh, uh that is the Okay, anybody else have a different interpretation of what he's saying here? Dylan? I feel like he's saying it's not that we don't have a lot of life and that we're begging for it and trying to get as much as we can, but that we have it and we're just choosing to spend it very, we're being really cheap with it and we're not taking advantage of it. Is that what you're getting from it? Uh, yes, or that, or that we're wasting it. Yeah. Um, we're, we're spending it without thinking about it. We're like drunken sailors with our time. We're not, we're just... We, we're, we're not, we, we think, oh God, life is so short that we're begging to have more. We've got plenty of it and we're just wasting it all over the place. Beggars aren't people that have a bunch of life and a bunch of money and are just spending it all over town. But that's like what we are with our time and then we perceive ourselves to be not having much of it. And it's exactly the opposite. Okay, we're squandering it like somebody that inherited a bunch of money and just wasted it. Okay? So that is a, that's a good one too, and it does connect with tranquility of the mind. And this is the invention of this idea of time is money. Um, but like money, time is therefore in, indifferent. And how much actual time we have is not what matters, but our approach to and use and really the condition of our soul when when we have it, when we live. Did somebody raise their hand? Yeah, go ahead. So, so the shortness is just a like almost false judgment of what our life is, in a sense. We don't have a, a short life. We, we just waste life. what we have. Okay. Yes. So life, quoting from the beginning of section two, life is long if only you know how to use it. Okay, so the, the point of on the shortness of life, don't get confused by the title, it's not on the fact that life is short, it's on the confusion of thinking life is short. Thinking life is short is a view not fitting for a wise person to hold, and he actually takes Aristotle to task for having, and other people to task, for saying that it's short. It's not short, we, we waste it. That saying, saying it's short is like a rich person having blown all of their money gambling, saying there's not enough money in this world. <laughs> okay, so what about you, Cheyenne? So I have section 18 from All the Shortness of Life. Um, the passage I chose from this is to reflect on the number of ways you have met, the number of storms you have endured. Some in private life, while others in public, you have brought on your own head. Now, you have now given sufficient proof of your virtue by laboring without respite for all to see. Test what it can do in your leisure. The greater part, certainly, the better part of your life has been given to your country. Take some time for yourself as well. I do not call you to a repose that is idle or inactive, or to drown all your personal energy of sleep and pleasures that delight the crowd. That is not rest. You will discover the release of your retirement tasks to keep you busy that outweigh those that you pursued with such energy before now. I think that this basically just means like keep an accounting of what you've contributed in your life. Obviously, if you've been paying attention to what you've been doing in your life at all, you would know like what you've done right, what you haven't done right, and obviously all of these struggles that you have overcome. But once you reach your retirement age, whatever that is, you should just take some time to contribute to things that matter to you personally rather than to everyone else. Yes, so a very concrete piece of advice. Um, and I'm sure you're not really looking forward to retirement yet since you don't even have a job. Yeah, right? Well, but, I, I do work part-time. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so you are looking forward to retirement. Yes. yes. I'm looking forward to retirement. 
Um, okay, and do you know who he's saying that to? Um, Paulinus? Yeah. And what do you, do you know anything about him? Um, not beyond what was in the text. Right. He's, he's, he's a knight, he's this kind of uh, bureaucrat, and he's in charge of grain distribution in Rome. Is that what so in other words, he's had a very, very stressful job. He decides who goes hungry and who doesn't, basically, by distributing grain. And so he's constantly dealing with people coming to him saying, we need more, and dealing with finite resources and trying to distribute them. And he's saying, yes, you've had this stressful career doing all of this stuff. Um, and don't think you have to keep going on doing it. Retire and do something, do something else good. But that's because he has already done a lot of good with it so that he can look back on that and reflect on his virtuous action, not forget the past, not ignore the future, and not dread or fear, but not, not, not ignore the present and not dread or fear uh, the future. All right, what's next? I really like um, section three, kind of the whole thing, but just to highlight certain parts, um, it really like stuck out to me when he said, no one is found, no one is found who would be willing to divide up his own money, but when it comes to life, each of us gives others a share in it, and how many others. Um, and then he goes on to say, think of how much your time was taken by a creditor or uh, mm -hmm. by a mistress, by a client, how much you're arguing, and then he kind of contrasts that with how much time have you spent on yourself, um, when your face was kept a normal expression, when your mind didn't succumb to fear. And um, the first part, I feel like he's really highlighting like, our value systems and kind of the stoic idea of treating external things as a good in themselves. And he's highlighting like, why that's a problem. And when you treat money as a good in itself, or um, even others' opinions or whatever, you, you allow it to take away from your own um, goodness and your own time. And then comparing uh, you know, our day to when he says, how much have you spent arguing or punishing slaves versus how much have you spent uh, with yourself? Like, how much of our day is spent doing all these frivolous things that don't actually help us in any way? And how much time we actually spend like, benefiting ourselves? Um, and I kind of compared <coughs> the first part to this thing I read a while ago. And he's like, imagine this, if you had eight, $86,400 in your account and someone stole $10, would you be upset and throw away the remaining money? It's like, no, you would keep the rest of your money. It's like the same thing. We have 86,400 seconds in each day, but you know, someone says one thing to us, it takes away 10 seconds of our day, and we let the rest of our day be ruined by allowing someone to pretty much steal our time. Off of yeah. It's like, it's, it's completely illogical. So this was some other writer or something you were reading about that was making this time money and now. Yeah, it's like some random. Interesting. No, 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 but, but you see, it comes from this. That's right. interesting. I mean, that, that, you read that in a magazine or something, and that is directly a descendant of this work. Okay, and this I and, and, and this comparison. The problem with time is money comparison is that we don't is that yes, it's very intuitive, but we don't actually treat it like that because we care about our money, and we, and we and we check our accounts and exactly how much we have. We take a we account by the cent of what it is. But do we, can, do we account for the seconds of our life, or even the minutes, or even the hours? That, and, and, and so he says, when it comes to the matter of wasting time, right, men are tight-fisted in keeping control of their finances. But when it comes to the matter of wasting time, they're positively extravagant in the one area where there's honor in being miserly. Right? So it would make sense if you're like, sorry, I don't have time to devote to... to this or that, and everybody should easily be able to understand that. But we won't, and so we'll just give away our time. Somebody asks us for a dime on the street, we're like, oh no, we can't, I, can't, I can't possibly afford to give you a quarter. But somebody wants to stop you on the street and you know talk about you know banning abortion or something. I got all day to you know waste in this conversation. I also really like the part where it says you fear everything is mortals, but you desire to have everything as gods. Um, yeah, like where is that? That's, uh, that's, that's really... It's closer to the end of section 3. Um, yes, so it's on the top of 143. You fear everything is mortals, but desire to have everything as gods. Um, and I feel like what he's kind of saying there is like, our fears make us small, so we try to forget about them and like not really pay attention to them, and we focus so much on our desires, because we feel infinite in our desires, like they grant us 
so much power but forgetting your fear in that aspect allows you to forget your time and how important it is and how much you shouldn't be spending um, like he gives another example later he talks about people putting off what they want to do in life until they retire and he's like you should be doing that now like you don't even know if you're doing right. that later. <laughs> right 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 <laughs> Yes, this is the problem with the look, looking forward to retirement thing. Right. Um, whatever you do, don't do that, because then you won't live in the present. But then encourage anyone you can to retire as soon as possible. <laughs> advice. Okay, so we've only got 11 minutes left, so we'll, I, I'm going to have to shut my mouth and let's go, let's go more quickly through calling our attention to some of these passages. Okay, um, one passage that I like was on page 147, near the end of section 7. Um, there is therefore no ground for thinking that because of his white hairs or wrinkles, someone has lived too long. He has not lived a long time, but existed a long time. And I think <laughs> kind of ties in with what you said about if life, if it's long, is it virtue in and of itself because it's long? I feel like the answer is no, because you might be old and aged, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're wise. Right, and so had a long life in the sense of having a lot of mm -hmm. uh, uh, making it worthwhile. Uh, yes, so once again, a nice, a nice rhetorical use of paradox there. Um, don't interpret my white hair and wrinkles as meaning I've lived a long time. I may have wasted all of my, all of my time. Okay, good. Um, one thing that helped for me relate the idea, understand the idea of fatalism with regards to, so uh, it's a comparison between two texts. In A Guide to the Good Life um, by William Irvine, which is another text I've been reading, it speaks about in their advocacy for fatalism. No, no I want a text from On the Shortest yes, yes, Life. Uh, uh, I was going to go compare it to On Tranquility, section 14. For, okay, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's go to that first. Okay. So, uh, on section 14, he says, Call obstinacy, from which fortune often steals something, is necessarily anxious and wretched, and frivolity is much more troublesome, since it never keeps itself under control. Both conditions are hostile to tranquility, not being able to change anything, and not being able to endure anything. I've made that comparison to change anything, reflecting kind of their view on fatalism, which is explained in uh, A Guide to the Good Life as the past, and endure anything as with regards to the present, because here they say, in their advocacy for fatalism, then the Stoics were advising us to be fatalistic, not with respect to the future, but with respect to the past and the present. So it helped me make that connection between understanding that often um, thinking about the past and the present and how we are a unable to change those is something that would prevent us from reaching the tranquil state of being. Like that's like the modern interpretation. Say that again. Think, say that last point again. Thinking about the past and the present, mm -hmm. dwelling on the past and the present is something as something that we can't change often prevents us from leading a tranquil life as like stipulated by a more modern transcription of Okay, so that and that's the opposite of what Seneca says, right? Yes. Because it, it, once again, it feels like you're giving advice that goes opposite of what he says, which is that we should dwell on the past because oh, it's no. outside of the scope of uh, but, fortune and it's already secure. But Seneca describes them as both conditions as hostile to tranquility, not being able to change anything and not being able to enjoy anything. So if you dwell on them, then you are, you are, like, in... Where's the part that says, if you dwell on them, then you are? And so oh, no, that, that's my interpretation, sorry. Right, so your interpretation is therefore the opposite. You're contradicting what he's saying, right? No, I'm saying that, right. His view is that we ought to dwell on the past, because it it's escaped from fortune. We dwell on the past and reflect on the ancient philosophers, and on our past virtuous activities. And by doing that, we escape the feeling that life is short. Oh, uh, I was saying by doing that, we, we are unable to reach a state of being tranquil, because uh, if you think about things that you cannot change in the current moment, which you cannot change, which is the present, then you can't be in a state of reach a state okay. of tranquility. Okay, fine. I just wanted to make sure you were aware that that's not, you're not embodying his view, you're contradicting him. Oh, right? yeah, okay, okay, in okay. that sense, yes. All right, Michael? Uh, mine's in uh, section 13, <clears throat> and it's like, so he goes on, 
about all the ways to, it would be a lengthy business to mention all the different people who spent their lives engaged in, in all these times, just a waste of time and stuff, but then he like fully grows in and, or sorry, he like talks about how it would be foolish to inquire into the number of things like, or the number of oarsmen Ulysses had, and like, you know, like, he's talking about useless facts or something like that, but then he goes and like displays all of this information that he has acquired about things that he's like, kind of, <laughs> I don't know if that was pretty uh, well, yes, that one, right, that's in 13? Yes. Of, of, of on short as Oh, yes, sir. Sorry, right, okay. Um, yes, that's kind of a touchy subject, because, you know, when you do ancient philosophy, you kind of <laughs> look into things like how many oars um, Ulysses had. So, uh, um, here he rails against um, scholarship, mm -hmm. really detailed scholarship, and, and here the kind of scholar and kind of philosopher Seneca is really comes out. He's not a detail, not like Chrysippus kind of level of detail. He's more into... He's like providing all these details. About I think that's funny things. because it gives us this view of scholarship then was very similar to what it is now, and <laughs> we think it's a waste of time. So, um, I agree with that. Okay. What about you? Um, I made a connection between section 14 around the shortness of life and the book I read for the, my scholar assignment, which was Adam's uh, you know, Citadel. And, uh, and Adam's commentary of uh, really some meditations, he notes how really is asked the question when he's talking about uh, the difference between Epicurean and Stoic physics is it province or atoms? And he goes on, like, which one is right, which one yeah. doesn't matter. But then Adam notes in commentary that a realist isn't trying to you know, prove one over the other. In the end, he eventually said, "Like, oh, what, what matters uh, is that we're just trying to, you know, pursue wisdom and find out what is right." And so I think I like how it's a similar theme between Seneca and the really that it doesn't matter in the end, you know, which philosophy is the best or of the other. What matters is that we're pursuing wisdom, and I think that aligns with still philosophy. Well, I look, I look forward to what you say about that when Marcus Aurelius, and we'll read some of where he says that. It's either God or just atoms, or it's providence or just material bits flying around. Um, that might be a bit too hard and fast of a distinction, and it seems to be saying it's one interpretation of it, which it sounds like Addo and you reject, is that he's saying it's Epicureanism or Stoicism. It's either atoms and material bits flying around at random, or there's a god who's providentially organized the whole cosmos. That's that's one way to interpret what he's saying there. And then we know which yeah. side he thinks we should choose, right? Um, so I so I'll, 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 we'll have to get clearer on that, yeah. uh, or I'll, I'll have to find, hear about that interpretation. Okay, Noah. So what I thought was interesting is kind of going off what Michael said is putting chapter right after section thirteen about going against all detail-oriented studies, and then going straight into talking about just study philosophy and history of philosophy in general. Because <laughs> it right. seems like a lot of the topics in philosophy, especially if you want to get like true wisdom, like he wants you to, you kind of have to go into some detail-oriented work and maybe even reject some... Well, here's, here's a way that perhaps we're supposed to square that. Um, go into detail about ancient philosophy, but don't go into detail about Homer and how many boards. Uh, so, so don't do, drop this literature major and pick up a philosophy major, basically. Uh, but also, there is no fact of the matter about how many boards Odysseus had. It's a fictional story about a fictional person. It's a ridiculous thing to do. But if you were to look into what Socrates thought about how you should think about virtue. That you should go into as much detail, and you're right. That takes total absorption in, in doing it. So this might be one of these hardcore, I mean, there's a, it, it's not, and so I disagree actually with how Michael put it. It's not just, he's attacking scholarship and then he's telling you to pursue scholarship. When he's talking about doing philosophy here, he isn't talking about doing scholarship. This isn't like academic philosophy, like, what professors here do, what you know, Monty Johnson does. He's talking about being a <laughs> philosopher, right? Someone like Socrates, right? And let's not get confused about 
that just because a lot of people, including my colleagues, use the name, call themselves philosophers, and say what they're doing is philosophy. That's not, he's not talking about that kind of activity.